nice. Today we're going to talk about price points in fashion, uh, specifically what they are and what designers can do to design for a specific price point. So what is a price point? So the fashion industry has a number of different price points that represent a grouping of cost, starting with very inexpensive clothing to the most expensive. These groupings are called price point and describe the clothing offered within a set price range. So for the fashion industry, these are our basic uh, price points. Now, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of sort of, you know, fuzziness in between the borders depending on uh, the type of garment, the designer themselves, the brand, uh, and how they're being sold. Um, but basically, this is the generally accepted um, list of price points. And even these, since they're not really set in stone, can change. So if you look other places, they may have some different names for them, they may have fewer or more price points. Um, really, this is the full sort of set of them, but a lot of places you can see sort of budget and discount kind of looped together, better and contemporary kind of looped together, um, but these are sort of the full set of them. So, um, and of course they go from least expensive to the most expensive. And again, they're not set in stone. There are, you know, approximate price ranges that we're going to set dollar amounts to, but they're by no means set in stone. These are sort of just ideas um, and, and very, very loose um, sort of labels that are put on sort of general um, price chunks or sort of price ranges. Uh, but like I said, there's lots of overlap where, you know, maybe the most expensive garment in moderate might even be more expensive than something in contemporary or better. Um, uh, that would be considered very cheap for that category. Um, and we're going to also go into sort of what makes garments cost what they do, but that will be in the next section. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at all of these different price points and sort of what they mean and, and some examples of each one. So let's start at discount. Um, the discount price range is also known as off price. And this is the lowest price point for the ad fashion industry. Although there are designers that create clothing specifically for this price point, many of the clothing that you'll find in this price point is simply clothing that didn't sell well at their original price point and is now discounted. So everything that you see on sale, um, typically larger amounts of sale discount, you know, sometimes you'll see things of 10, 20 uh, percent off, but this is really going to be more of your, you know, 30 to 50 percent off uh, sorts of uh, garment items. And uh, discount clothing will usually retail below $50. And again, you'll be able to see discount clothing in lots of um, stores. Anything that they um, put on sale um, could be considered discount or off price, especially at department stores. They typically have whole racks of uh, discounted or on sale uh, garments. But of course, there are some stores that specialize in new clothing um, that isn't discounted, it just is very cheap to begin with. And some examples of stores that sell at the discount price point are Walmart or the Discount Fashion Warehouse. Next is the budget category. It's also called economy. And this price point contains most fast fashion brands. Although some fast fashion brands will bleed on into um, moderate, like Zara. Uh, the clothing contained in the budget price point are usually of cheaper material, materials and low, lower quality construction. Clothing in this category will usually retail below $100. So stores and brands that are categorized in this budget price point include Old Navy, Charlotte Russe, Wet Seal, and H&M. Now, things like um, H&M are very, very much uh, fast fashion. Old Navy, not so much. So it's not, budget and, and fast fashion are not synonymous. Um, and to sort of learn the difference, let's go ahead and take a look at our next slide, which is about fast fashion. So although fast fashion usually indicates a price point within the budget category, it again can reach into the moderate category as well, like here with Zara, like I mentioned. Also, fast fashion is more than just a price point. It is a business model. 
So other things come along with being fast fashion that are more than just a cheap uh, price point. Fast fashion focuses on creating cheaply made clothing very quickly, hence the fast part of its name. It emphasizes a quick turnover in clothing, coming out with new collections every month instead of seasonally. This quick turnover encourages increased foot traffic into their stores and persuades the customer to buy more. So the combination of all of these things is really what makes fast fashion. It's the cheap price point along with this very, very quick production of clothing. Um, and again, it's very, very good at encouraging people to come into the store again and again and again. Um, so not even do they come out with uh, collections every month, but even the store model, um, they will move around clothes, put new things on the mannequins pretty much weekly. So even if they haven't gotten something in, it'll look like they have gotten something in. And again, this really, really encourages people to come in again and again, much more frequently, buy things more frequently, um, and again, they're also persuaded to do so with that low price point. Um, it also allows them to sort of grasp onto quick changing trends very easily. Since they're coming out with collections, you know, every month, they're able to grab something that is maybe just a, a flash in the pan fad, but they're able to realize it and put it into stores very, very quickly. So they're able to capitalize on these sort of quick moving trends or maybe short lived um, little uh, uh, blips on the radar when it comes to fashion. Next we have our moderate price point. Moderate is one of the largest price points that designers try to work within. So you can imagine it's sort of average, the most amount of people um, sort of look within the moderate price point, especially for when they start to look for quote unquote quality clothing. It encompasses clothing with moderate quality and materials and construction. And clothing within this category usually retails below $300. Examples of moderately priced brands and stores include The Gap, Free People, Zara, etc. Also, Macy's department store sells mostly moderately priced clothing, although um, they have a large shirt selection of brands and items that can range less and more from the moderate. But the majority of their products do fall within the moderate, moderate price point. Next, we have the better category. So this price point sits just above moderate and serves much of the same customer base as the moderate price point. It acts as a premium option for moderate price point buyers who want a little extra from their purchase. Better price point clothing usually retails at under $500. And this is the lowest price point at which a quote unquote designer label can be licensed out. So what does that mean? So typically when we have a designer, um, They'll have a designer label, but they'll license out different brands at different price points to try to get a larger customer base. However, they can only go so low. If they start selling at price points below the better category, their view of a sort of designer or as a high-end designer or as a premium label uh, starts to be diluted. So people no longer see the premium value of a designer label if it goes below this price point. Examples of better price point stores are Armani Exchange, Perry Ellis, or Bailey 44. Sort of as a partner to the better uh, price point is Contemporary, and they're very, very similar. Um, but they can run a little bit higher in this price point, just a bit. Um, although, just like fast fashion, it usually entails a bit more than just the price point. Uh, contemporary price point is usually associated with trendy, fashion forward styles marketed toward women in their 20s and 30s. So you can really look as contemporary as sort of an offshoot of the better price point. Um, one that the price is very similar, but it has a very specific customer in mind, a sort of young fashion forward woman. Uh, contemporary clothing usually retails um, for below $600.
Examples of contemporary stores and brands are Bebe, BCBG, and Betsy Johnson. Didn't mean to make that alliterative, it just happened. Next is our bridge price point. And the bridge price point gets its name because it's meant to quote unquote sort of bridge the gap into the more high-end price points. Most high-end designers will offer um, a bridge brand along with their designer brand. It's sort of making their high-end goods a little bit more accessible to the general public. Um, again, they might go all the way down to a Bretter or a contemporary price point, but um, usually they will always have a bridge uh, brand or licensing in partnership with their designer label. The clothing in this category is meant to provide a high-end design and quality at a slightly more affordable price. Bridge collections are also known as diffusion lines. Diffusion sort of means to dis disperse through. And in this case, it's describing how they're trying to disperse through a larger market segment. Clothing in the bridge category usually retails at under $1,000. Examples of bridge stores and brands include DKNY, Lauren by Ralph Lauren, and Yu Mew. Next we have the designer price point. The designer price point usually offers very high-end clothing with superior quality materials and construction. Clothing found within the designer price point will usually come from a famous designer who acts the face of the company. So again, when we see our labels, it usually has either a very old designer attached to the house, um, where the house gets its name, or a new designer who has given their name to the house. Even in the case where we have old designers as the name of the house, we typically know the famous designer behind it. Um, take Karl Lagerfeld, you know, rest in peace for Chanel, Alexander McQueen, um, so on and so forth. Um, examples of designer brands include Prada, Gucci, Versace, etc. Although it may seem like these are all separate companies, most designer brands, especially European designer brands, are actually owned by one conglomerate, LVMH. Now LVMH stands for Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. And um, as mentioned, uh, they own most all of the European and some American luxury um, brands. Uh, they also own a lot of uh, beverage, uh, accessory um, brands. Anything sort of within that umbrella of European luxury, it's probably owned by one company, again, LVMH. At the very top, we have Haute Couture. Um, Haute Couture means literally high sewing in French, and this price point represents the pinnacle of quality design and construction. Haute Couture pieces are really considered um, one-of-a-kind works of art, even more so sometimes than actual functioning wearable garments. Only one garment in each collection is made for only one cu customer, so each one of these is only made once. There is not another one of any sort of design made again. Um, it's to help retain the uniqueness of the garment and also the value. Just like works of art, Hokotor garments are often bought as an investment, not just for wearing. So when people invest in a Hokotor garment, they may wear it and they may intend to. However, a lot of times they're never worn, they're just kept as sort of a work of art. Um, in hopes that their value uh, will increase and then um, someday they can sell it to a museum or to another collector. Haute couture garments are usually priced at over $10,000 but can reach easily into the millions. Right now there are only 10 official brands um, that are allowed to have haute couture lines. They are Adeline Andre, Alexandra Vauthier, Alexis Mayville, uh, Bouchra Jarrard, Chanel Dior, Frank Sorbier, Jean-Baptiste uh, Jean Valley, Givinci, Jean-Paul Gaultier, 
Julian Fournier, Mason Margiela, Morzio Galante, Schiaparelli, and Stephanie Rowland. Excuse my pronunciation for some of those, as I'm not <laughs> entirely sure it was 100% accurate. Now, Haute Couture, um, the name gets tossed around a lot, um, but again, only these 10 official brands are allowed to have, um, ho or call themselves Haute Couture. However, um, the name is sort of used a little bit more loosely, loosely for other brands and designers and companies that have a similar model where they sell very expensive custom-made uh, clothing. Um, however, uh, this name is and the uh, ability to use it and the ability to call yourself uh, a haute couture line is um, overseen by the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. Uh, again, pardon my pronunciation. And that is a French association um, that has different criteria on whether or not you may be allowed to call yourself haute couture. Now the criteria is loosely based around uh, the ability to design made to order uh, garments for private clients with at least one or more fittings. So a private client will have to come in and um, your garment is made only for them, it's one of a kind for them, and it's fit specifically to them. So you've had at least one um, fitting with them, sometimes more. However, I have heard that you can get a discount on your haute couture garment if you just happen to be the same size and you don't need those fittings. Um, another, one of part, uh, another criteria is that you have a workshop in Paris with at least 15 uh, full-time staff members. You also must have to have at least 20 full-time craftspeople and at least one workshop or atelier. And you must show a collection with at least 50 looks publicly every season. So that would be fall and spring. So those are our price points. So how do we design for a specific price point? Well, to design for a specific price point, we have to know what goes into the cost of a garment. When we understand what goes into the cost of a garment, we can think about these different things when designing to ensure um, our garments are not going to be too expensive for their specific price point. But again, it's not just a question of making it too expensive. Sometimes we must make it expensive. So when we get to the higher end price points, we must sort of justify the fact that a garment is costing so much. So we have to look at these different elements of why a garment costs what it is to ensure that all these things are sort of sitting at the right level for our price points. And um, when we choose our fabrics, we choose our designs, and we choose um, our performance for our garments as a designer, um, we can make sure that they are aligning correctly with whatever price point we're designing for. So. There are three main categories in why a garment costs what it does. There are materials, labor, and performance. And I want to talk a little bit more in depth on each one of these things. So the main cost of a garment will come from its fabric. So why are some fabrics more expensive than others? So there are a number of different factors that go into how expensive a fabric type is, but one of them is fiber type. This refers to what the yarns of the fabric are spun out of. Um, and this refers to both wovens and knits, um, and basically is reflective of how easily harvested and plentiful fibers are. So, um, at the very low end of the spectrum, we have synthetics. And synthetics are basically um, plastic polymers that have been created 
that go into fabrics like nylons and acrylics, uh, polyesters, rayons, um, acetates, all these different types of synthetic fabrics. And they were developed specifically to be a cheaper alternative to our natural fibers. So um, one can imagine that they are indeed uh, less expensive than our other natural fibers. So our pure synthetics are on the very bottom of our price scale. Um, and this is mostly true, um, except for some more slightly expensive synthetic fabrics like viscose that take extra processing to create, to make it extra soft, sort of extra shiny, things like that. Um, next up is cotton, which is very easy. It comes from a plant, so it is very easily propagated um, and very plentiful. So it is typically a fairly cheap fiber to work with. Next up is wool, which comes usually from a sheep, although can come from other sources. Um, but again, uh, animals need a little bit extra care um, than a plant does. They need to be fed a little bit more than just sort of watered and fertilized. Uh, they also need to be shorn, which is a little trickier than the harvesting. Um, so because of that extra work, wool is more expensive. Next up we have silk, which comes from the cocoon of the silk moth. And it is a little bit more expensive because the silk uh, cocoon itself is very, very small. So you need quite a lot of them uh, to make a, any sort of fabric. In addition to the cocoons being quite small, the threads and yarns and fibers uh, that we harvest from the cocoon are very, very fine. So you need quite a lot of them uh, to twist into a substantial yarn. Um, so again, because of this, silk tends to be harder to cultivate in large quantities and so is more expensive. On the very top are specialty fibers. So this is an angora goat. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's a cashmere goat. My, my bad. Um, and we'll see lots of these sort of specialty fibers, things coming from, you know, cashmere goats, um, angora from angora rabbits or angora goats. Uh, things like uh, alpaca uh, wool that come from uh, less frequently cultivated animals uh, that are either wild, so in the case of the vicuna, the vicuna is a wild animal, so it is not domesticated, um, so harvesting is quite difficult, um, but the reason we still do it is they have very fine, very elegant um, fibers uh, that create very, very warm, very, very soft fabrics, um, but they tend to be very expensive just because of their rarity. Now, I also want to mention that this is not set in stone. Not every silk fabric is going to be more expensive than every wool fabric. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this. This is sort of just a generalized um, spectrum where most silk, silks are more expensive than most wools. But again, every fiber has its own quality level. So there are very low quality cottons um, and there are very high quality cottons. And of course, we might see a very, very high quality cotton that is more expensive than a very, very low quality silk, um, for example. To make it even more complicated, we can blend fibers. So if I have a cotton that I would like to make a little bit less expensive, I can blend it with a synthetic. Uh, and you see that a lot um, with sort of cotton poly blends on lower ends of the price point spectrums. Um, we blend in a little bit of a cheaper fiber to a more expensive fiber to keep it within a price point. And you can see that all across the spectrum, we can blend synthetics with almost all of these different fibers to make them a little bit less um, expensive. Also, the amount of fabric used in a garment will also have a big um, impact on how expensive it is. 
So if I have a uh, jacket, say, and it's long, it's, it's going to start to be expensive because that's a lot of fabric that I need to cover my body from sort of long sleeves, um, long jacket, um, so on and so forth. And what we can do to sort of temper the pri price or to make sure that we're working within a cheaper price point or within our price point is we can use our fabrics um, either sparingly um, or as trims. So let's say I want to make a jacket but I'm concerned with the price. Well, it's probably going to be wool, um, but let's say that I'm going to blend that wool with the synthetic to already make it a little less expensive. But I want it to feel expensive. I don't want it to feel cheap. Well, what I can do is I can use higher priced fabrics or materials in a very small quantity on my jacket. Um, for example, let's take something like, I haven't mentioned fur or leather in here. Fur and leather, sort of, if it's, if it's actual real fur or leather, kind of sits a little bit above silk and a little below specialty fibers. But of course, then you can get into, um, you know, specialty furs, which are very, very expensive, um, and specialty level leathers, which are also um, kind of on the same uh, level as specialty fibers. But I don't want to get too into it because it's pretty esoteric, um, and I kind of just want to go over the general spectrum of things. But let's go back to that jacket. So I want it to sort of feel a little bit more luxurious. So let's say I make a leather trim on the cuff. So I make a leather cuff. Um, maybe I put a little bit of leather detailing on the collar or lapel. So you have this more expensive fabric uh, or material um, that you're utilizing within the garment. However, you're not using a lot of it, so you're getting the sort of feeling of a more luxurious, expensive um, garment um, by incorporating that material, but you're not making the price go up that much because you haven't used that much of it. So um, the amount of fabric um, uh, plays a big role, of course, obviously that makes sense, into how much a uh, garment is going to cost. And by using sort of small little dabs, little points of more expensive materials, we can create a garment that doesn't feel cheap, uh, but still remains within its price point. So like I said, um, fiber alone is not the best indicator to how expensive a fabric is going to be. Um, we have a almost infinite amount of different fabric types to choose from um, and their properties in itself will make a fabric be more or less expensive. So I'm not going to go over every single fabric type because we'd be here all day, but I want to look and point out the specific properties that make a fabric more or less um, expensive. Of course we have our fiber type, you know, um, first and foremost, but the other partner to that is how that fiber is spun um, and woven into a fabric or knit into a fabric because of course we have knits as well. So generally fabrics that are densely woven and thick um, use more fiber than sparsely woven thin fabrics and so are more expensive. This makes sense, right? If a fabric is thick, bulky, heavy, more fiber is used, more material equals more expensive. Light, thin, sort of, you know, um, uh, almost translucent or transparent or sheer fabric uses less fiber and so are less expensive. The more fiber um, it, that is used to make a fabric, the more expensive it will be. Easy. Also, the complexity of the weave itself can make a fabric more expensive. And we'll get to that at the end of this. So let's take a look at just some general examples of fabric kind of moving up from thin to heavy. And of course, in these categories, we'll see them get a little bit more expensive. Um, first, I want to start with sort of our most sparse, open, uh, thin, light fabrics. And I kind of want to highlight open weaves. 
So open weaves are typically plain weaves, which is just our basic over-under pattern. Um, however, there is a little bit of space between each one of the yarns, and this makes them very sparse and often sheer. Over here we have examples of uh, a black tulle and a white chiffon. As we can see, they are both quite sheer, um, and not a lot of fiber has been used to make the fabric. Now chiffon is traditionally made out of silk and tulle also traditionally made out of silk. However, today we mostly see tulle made out of synthetic um, fabric uh, fibers. Uh, tulle is also typically used as uh, an under construction. It's very, very stiff, has a lot of structure even though it's very, very thin. Um, and that comes from the stiffness of the synthetic yarns created uh, used to create it. Uh, chiffon, on the other hand, is beautifully flowing and soft, and we can kind of see that in the nature of the fabric. Here we see these sharp corners sort of jutting out. Here we see these sort of soft, rounded folds where we can tell the kind of nature of the fabric. Now, of course, um, these are, if this is a lovely, high-quality silk, it may be even more expensive than some of these um, light to medium weight cottons because silk is more expensive. However, if it's a poly chiffon, it is definitely going to be much less expensive than um, e cottons or even cotton polys or even polys in the medium to lightweight category. Moving on in our light to medium weight fabrics, um, these fabrics contain light to moderate amounts of fiber and are more uh, uh, kind of on the lightweight side of things. Um, they can be semi-sheer, but they're moving into a more opaque uh, nature. Uh, two examples of a sort of light to medium weight fabrics are uh, this uh, pop, I'm sorry, jersey up here and poplin down here. Now jersey is a knit, it's typically a sort of lightweight t-shirt material. Um, soft, lightweight, at some times semi-sheer depending on, on how lightweight it is, um, sometimes not sheer if it's more on the medium side of things, uh, and poplin as well. Poplin is our woven um, partner to that. Uh, they're both typically made out of cotton but can be made out of cotton poly or polyester. Um, and uh, poplin, typical sort of um, normal plain weave, can be sheer. Uh, to, uh, well, I'd say semi-sheer, I wouldn't say completely sheer, it can be kind of semi-sheer um, to opaque. Um, and again, sort of the same here, our jersey is a soft, limp, flowing type of fabric, and our poplin is typically a shirting fabric, which is much more crisp and sharp. Over here to our medium to heavyweight fabrics, these fabrics are usually thicker, warmer, and use more fiber. They are usually never sheer, and twill weaves start to appear at medium weights. So twill weaves are a type of weave um, that is obviously not a plain weave. Instead of going over, under, over, under, um, our filler yarns will go over two, under one, over two, under one, and then stagger it as they go. This creates a little bit of a diagonal ribbing pattern on the surface of the fabric. So if you look at your, you know, you know your denims, um, really closely, you'll see a little bit of this sort of diagonal ribbing coming through the fabric. And that's the twill weave. Twill is the strongest of our weaves, um, and it's usually because of its durability a little bit thicker. So that's why we begin to see them here. We don't really see twills um, at a lighter than medium weight. Examples of medium to heavy fabrics here um, are a gabardine. Um, which is a suiting fabric, typically made out of wool, but we can see uh, wool silk or silk varieties of it. Um, a knit, a sort of sweater knit, so a little bit heavier than our um, t-shirt knit. Um, and of course, denim, um, which goes a little bit more to the heavy side of things. Now we also have the heavy to bulky weight fabrics, and these tend to be our most expensive fabrics. They are very thick and usually reserved for outerwear, so something that you're going to make a coat out of. Uh, and that's because they can be incredibly warm. 
um, but they use a lot of fiber, so of course they will be very expensive. Um, examples to the left include a black melton, which is a traditional type of uh, wool coating. So uh, coating fabrics, again, are typically in this category of being very heavy, warm, thick fabrics. Um, we have a fur fabric here, again, very bulky and heavy. Uh, this happens to be a synthetic uh, fox fur. And we have leather here as well. Again, um, nowadays we can finish leather to be rather thinner. Um, so we can see it more, you know, on the medium heavy side, but traditionally leathers are in the heavy to kind of bulky weight uh, fabrics. And again, because they are, have so much fiber in them, because they're so thick um, and warm, <laughs> they can be quite expensive. Now, actual fiber content um, and you know the amount of it is not the only thing that goes into whether or not a fabric is going to be expensive. The weave itself um, plays a big role. Now these um, previously from here we looked at you know some twills, uh, some plain weaves which are fairly simple weaves. Um, we looked at knits that are you know the jersey is just your basic knit that knit we looked at has some patterning in it, but not too complicated, maybe a little bit more um, complicated, which can make it a little bit more expensive. But we have some very complex weave types and complex fabrics that are just simply very difficult to create. Um, even though we make them on modern looms, and most of these are not you know, woven by hand anymore, uh, the sheer complexity of them um, takes a longer time to make them, even with a modern loom. And because they take a longer time to make, it makes them more expensive. Complex weaves can be light or heavy in weight. Um, and our examples here are lace. We have a black lace. We have a red and gold brocade um, and a beaded fabric down here. Now with these, um, brocades, uh, which are a subset of jacquards, are very, very complica complicated weaves. So this is not, this pattern is not printed on. It's actually woven into the pattern with different colored yarns. Um, traditional brocades are made only of silk, which again, since silk is a very expensive fiber, and brocades itself are a typically kind of um, dense, um, heavier in weight fabric. We kind of have all these markers. So it's silk, it has a lot of fiber in it because it's quite dense, it has a complex weave. So you can imagine that a silk brocade is one of the more expensive fabrics that we can find. And this of course is true. Lace, in addition, uh, because of its complexity and also delicacy, so it's very difficult to create, um, is very expensive. That's why if you've gone to the fabric store, you'll typically see that they keep their laces, or at least their good laces, um, locked in a glass case. Now I'm also including a sort of beaded fabric like this um, to represent fabrics that either have embellishes embellishments that are woven in or added on after the weaving process. So we can again um, add different sort of beatings or sequins or, or things like that um, and of course not only does it make it more expensive because we're adding a different material um, but it is also more complex especially if it has to be added on afterwards especially especially if it has to be added on by hand especially, especially, especially if that, if, you know, take here, what is at being added on is an expensive material. So if these were real pearls added on by hand after weaving, obviously that's going to make this fabric incredibly expensive, especially by how dense those pearls would be, um, how much labor went into it, and just the sheer cost of the materials being added to the fabric. So again, we have a wide world, world of fabrics, um, but if we take a, just a, a broad look at fiber and how much fiber is used and how complex the 
fabric is to make, we can get a really good idea of how expensive the fabric is and where it should fall within our price points. Of course, we're going to see, you know, fabrics like this. Um, let's imagine it really was pearls that were, were, were hand sewn on. That's going to be your designer couture um, price points, whereas, you know, um, on the cheaper ends, we're going to see simple, simpler things, maybe more synthetic fibers, um, so on and so forth. So although fabric is the main ingredient of a garment, fabric isn't the only cost when making one. Of course, we have all of our different hardwares, um, trimming, buttons, so on and so forth. So here are just some examples. Uh, zippers, of course, especially if we want to uh, make a fancy zipper pull. So this is an example, you know, zippers are not usually an expensive item, but if we decide to sort of jazz it up a little bit and make a little sort of, you know, rings with little pearls and little gold things for our zipper pulls, we're going to start to get a little bit more expensive. Buttons too, we have a lot of different button types, um, which again aren't typically seen as expensive, but when we get into the realm of maybe uh, making them out of uh, higher quality materials, brass, uh, putting maybe crystals in them, things like that, um, having them be have little artworks or custom artworks in them, they're going to get a little bit more expensive. Um, so uh, as well as trimming. So we can trim garments and add different sorts of hardwares um, to them that can make them more expensive. So these are all these types of embellishment. And all garments need thread and snaps or maybe hook and eyes or elastic or interfacing, uh, things like that. Now when we get over here, this is it's not a huge impact on the cost of the garment because again, thread and hook and eyes and snaps, just they're not that much money and it's really hard to get a high-end sort of, you know, hook and eye, uh, to be quite blunt. Um, but it's still a factor and usually is just sort of tacked on um, as a additional dollar amount to the cost of production. So, you know, it's, I'm not going to figure out exactly how much thread I use for a garment. I'm just going to tack on maybe 50 cents to a dollar to the cost of making a garment and call it, you know, that's my uh, thread and snap budget for the, for the garment. But again, um, these are things that make, can make garments more expensive and have to be considered um, when considering the full cost of a garment. So that's our materials again, and that's probably the largest and main factor when going into the cost of a garment. Um, however, the next couple sections are also very important, um, and uh, we're going to go into labor costs in our next segment. So I'm going to take a little break, and I'll pick up with labor costs in our next video.